What's good, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Goats of Growth. Please subscribe, rate, and review if you haven't already. And like always, the J. David Group, which is my company, is sponsoring this episode. We help recruit today's go-to-market teams that will lead the next generation of unicorns. Email me, web, at thejdavidgroup.com to learn more about how we can help. And of course, don't forget, working on a book called The Goats of Growth, which is the untold stories of the greatest revenue leaders of all time, which is due out at the end of 2023. Now, my guest today is Jeff Kushmerick, who is the CEO and founder of Infinite Renewals, which helps SaaS B2B emerging tech companies reduce churn and significantly increase recurring revenue. And who doesn't want that? <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> Thanks for coming on right. to yeah. Boats of Growth. <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me, Jay. Really appreciate it. Yeah, you, you you will agree with that last statement I just made, right? Who doesn't want that that question? Yeah, I, I think everybody wants that. They just don't rec- realize how to do that sometimes, right? But uh, we, we can get into that a little bit <laughs> during the talk. You know what? Why wait? Let's get into it right now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, happy to. The, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I've labeled 2023 as the year of GRR and NRR, and people are like, huh? And and uh, and the CS people that I know are very much like, oh, that's so 2020 of you, but they don't realize that, you know, outside the CS bubble, um, a lot of people are just focused on top line growth, and then mm-hmm. suddenly they're wondering why their boards and everything are like, hey, what's going on over here, right? And so, um, you know, a lot of new founders and, you know, new tech execs and things like that, if they haven't been through um, uh, the whole growth trajectory of a company, they're super focused and being told by their boards like grow, 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 logos, 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 which is great, makes the world go around. They also have to focus on the other side, which is keeping those customers, right? So it's classic easy math, you know, you sell $50 million of software in ARR one year, and your account team is then focused on doubling that up uh, the next year, they need to go focus on that. In the meanwhile, what happens to that 50 million that's sitting there? You need to make sure that they get the value out of the software and renew it and things like that. And that's um, pretty much, you know, one of the biggest indicators of churn is that people are like, I, I don't, I'm not getting any value out of this, right? So, so, um, so that's what we're, I'm really focusing on and, and working with a lot of people this year because they just haven't invested in the systems and customer success or, or you know, the people and the process is needed to renew and expand their, their, um, their customer base. And, and they've just been really focused on that top line revenue growth. Why this year in particular, Jeff, are you focused so much on an RR and GRR? Yeah, and for, those who, and, and for those who are unfamiliar, uh, the acronym NRR and GRR, just tell us yep. what those stand for. And I swear, <laughs> when, when I talk about these too much, <laughs> I have to open up the old Googles myself sometimes. <laughs> but, um, but I, you know, net recurring, actually, I'm going to just pull it, pull it up right now just to make sure. But it, when you look at net recurring revenue, it is essentially, um, you know, you've got AR, which is how much, you know, you've sold. And then with net re- recurring revenue, it's how much you've you've been able to um, add to the account minus the co- the loss of closed accounts or churned accounts, essentially. And then um, with gross, it's essentially adding in the factor of um, the expansion and the renewals. So you get that overall sort of top level. NRR is a little easier to focus on as well, too. Um, so we, we go from there. Um, but I'll tell you why, so regardless of which factor, because some boards look at different ones, the, I, the, I, I try and demystify all of those complicating things and just say, you're going to, you're going to need to focus on it this year because of, uh, Hey, you should in general, like it's churn is bad. Um, but also with the macroeconomic conditions that went on in the second half of last year or, or, um, 2022 for the people listening to this in the future, um, that, uh, you know, a lot of people were just saying like, oh, this huge number over here, it's because of the bad, all the bad stuff that happened in 2022. And yeah, there's certainly a percentage that goes into that. But um, if, if you go through and you look at and do some churn analysis and went through and talked to some customers, what I typically hear is that um, they don't get contact after the deal is closed. 
and then the software is launched, right? And um, and that's a huge issue, right? Um, because um, you know, I, I will also just to put a little asterisk and say my I, I primarily focus on SaaS B two B, which is a little bit more complicated. So um, regardless if you you know have a credit card and, and you know buy something and just sign up for it in a sort of a PLG model, or you've got very complex integrations and everything there's been this um uh, what's been happening out there is that people get them signed they get them launched and then they walk away um and and they maybe well maybe what they're doing is only doing reactive work with the customer which is support teams getting bugs or there's an escalation or you know they're getting ready for a big renewal and things like that so uh, and there's a bunch a lot of topics <laughs> to go into all of those and so i don't want to just immediately just come out with 15 minutes straight of that so i'll let you guys <laughs> the questions on that <laughs> well one question i have um well first i want to come back to the question of yeah. why companies do that right in other words why do they take the money and then just ignore them and walk away and just go on to the next thing. But I want to come back to the bigger picture for a second, which is that, you know, they're a macroeconomic environment that you alluded to yep. that occurred second half of 2022 and now into 2023 is obviously a challenge. And so by focusing on um, net recurring revenue, is it net recurring revenue or net retention? Revenue? Net retention. I, revenue. I, net recurring revenue. Okay. Um, net dollar revenue is also an NDR is another way to look at, but essentially NRR, yeah, net recurring. Yeah, in NGR. Yeah. Why is that so critical now? Is it because there are um, you need to it, it costs less for existing customer growth as opposed to new, or just get into that? Yeah, yeah, problem. yeah. Oh, there's first of all, there's that concept of the hardest thing to do is get a new customer, right? And so mm -hmm. it was a lot of money, you know, your uh, your your CAC side factors of like how much does it cost to go out there and get one with your salespeople and the marketing and all that fun stuff. So we all know, and sales is hard, right? And and I've certainly done a lot of sales, and and getting those new customers are extremely hard. So then there's the concept of like, well, why would you let them slip away, right? So that's that's always been a main concept, regardless of what happened. That was still when things were booming before the what happened last year um that that that's 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 always been sort of um a focus there um so um trying to like put my thoughts together on this i think you know what i'm hearing a lot i i work and interact a lot with boards and uh you know companies private equity or or um venture capitalists um in you know series a through c essentially and they get really scared when they see retention or churn is really high um you know um i'd say industry standard you, you want to shoot above 90 percent. 95 is like amazing and you're doing like the best thing of, of all time um so when you start getting below 90 it's like oh we should start looking into that right um as an investor it's very scary to say, to look at a lot of numbers and say, people, it, sometimes it's even worse. Okay, great, you convince them to buy your software. They don't wanna use it, right? Like they're not using it. They're not going to renew. They don't, do they not like it or they're not getting value out of it or there's that. So that's a huge signal for coming. And then you can correspond that with like, well, like some um, customer SAT scores or NPS, whatever that is. And, and but usually both of those are really down if there's, well, at least if I get brought in, but like that's what boards are looking at because it's an easier problem to fix. Um, and there's some standard reasons why this happened that we can get into. Um, but it, you know, it's essentially like you need to hold on to these customers and, and it, cause they're so hard to go out there and get, and then it, it should be easier to do. You just kind of have to put a lot of the right processes in place. And, um, in, in that board reason, that VC reason is, is a big reason why this is that year of retention, um, aligned with top line growth, but knowing that sales are going to be tough this year. Right. And basically, if, if you're, let's say, for instance, if you're a, let's say, let's say there's a customer or a company that's raising money, yeah. right? Series C to A or A to B. And what you're saying is, is if that they have these indicators that customers are using their product, they are happy, 
then the likelihood of them raising money increases, right? As opposed to, you know, if there, if there, uh, if there are indicators to your point that churn is below or, or retention is below 90% and is high churn, then raising money will be tougher. So forget about that it costs more to, to acquire new customers. That's, you know, been set up forever. But basically, if you're looking to raise money, especially in this economic environment, you better tighten up your um, your customer professional services organization so that uh, so the retention can remain high. Is that absolutely, right? absolutely. It, it's um, it, 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 there's in those two factors um, or, or two points on that is that uh, yeah, absolutely. People are looking at these retention numbers and combined with C, uh, CSAT or NPS, saying like, is this a good investment? Right. And so there's that aspect of things. And then you want your salespeople, especially at those stage of companies, to be hunters. You need to get logos. You need to do that. So they can't be focusing as much on the relationship. Um, or, or you put in a, 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 like your CS team, and I'll expand on this, but you know, at least let them do what I call like the value work. So if you want your account people to come in um, to maintain that relationship for the renewal and whatnot, it will be a very easy conversation for them to have. So I don't particularly like to get into the who owns the renewal and the upsell and, and, and all of that, because I believe it's very company specific and could be based on how big your deal sizes are and things like that. But what does need to happen regardless of that is that you, you know, your marketing team, your product team has come up with a series of positioning statements about why people need to buy your software, right? And those statements should, you know, we're, we're trying not to go with, um, with just, um, what am I trying to say? You don't want to just sell on features, right? You want to sell yep. on outcomes, right? Mm -hmm. So, so if you're selling on outcomes, that means, you know they're looking for a specific sort of things you need to keep showing them along the way that you're providing these outcomes for them and this is the key thing that most organizations drop the ball and that's why they're seeing retention because people are saying i'm not getting any value from this they might be but people might not be telling them until the end and maybe they've already made a decision right and you know factors that go into this the reason why they get bought and the key outcomes that they're looking for, like regardless of it's Spice or Challenger, or, you know, blue, blue, whatever, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's not getting um, translated um, to that team to go work on stuff. So you start hearing things like, uh, do you guys even talk to each other? We told your salespeople that and everything, right? Um, but if you have a scenario where every step of the way and all these different transition points people understand uh, on the on the on your companies on the software vendor side why this customer has bought it and what key outcomes they're looking for they can configure the system and make sure that the users understand how to use it in a way to get those outcomes that needs to happen that's usually your implementation slash onboarding team then you transition and over to your csm um, to be able to maintain that relationship to expand on those you know, and then hopefully every, you know, it's usually a 90 day period, you QBR, whatever, you need to bring that data in and show the people who sign the contract, because another core thing that happens is that, you know, uh, you know, CIO signs deal hands over to somebody in IT, they run it project manager to project manager. And that's where they're those two are just talking value stuff never gets raised back up to CIO, you know, just as a very broad example there. So you need to be able to start communicating that stuff, that data back into them so that they can see the value that they're getting. And then if they're not getting the value, put a plan together over the next 90 days to get that value out. And that, if you start doing activities like that, so that they're realizing they're getting their key outcomes, you can sell the ROI story, and then your renewal and then your expansion is going to be a lot easier from there. What about early indicators, right? You mentioned, obviously, the handoff yeah. early on, but what are some of the early indicators that it's not going as well as you would hope? It, yeah, to go, yeah. Right. So the, yeah. you know, having that conversation a year later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So right from the, from the get go, um, you know, 
if they're not showing up to those implementation meetings, right? You know, still say just to make things easier, uh, you know, 30 day implementation period, right? You know, can get complex for, you know, I can go up to, you know, six months or so. So if, if the team's not showing up, if you're using software to track milestones, um, cause you know, it's a, you know, both sides of the fence are, are working on stuff. They're not getting their deliverables done. They're not giving you the data. They're not doing their security stuff. Suddenly it's like, they don't care about this, right? Um, and then you gotta kind of go back to the person who signed the contract and like, look, you, you're paying us X amount of dollars and your team's not doing X. And so then they, they start getting, so that's, that's, the implementation that's that's the first sort of like early indicator from there then from there um you are onboarding the users usually right so you get the system set up then you bring the users on board then you have to monitor their usage so if their usage is down um that's one now a lot of people stop like they look at broad usage numbers and this is why um there's been a, a newer team in the CS world that's come about called CS Ops. You know, we all love our RevOps people. Same <laughs> sort of thing on the other side. Yeah, sometimes we don't <laughs> when they're holding commissions back and everything. But like, um, but like, um, they're super helpful to be able to then slice into things. So let's say, for example, you've got five modules, right, that are critical to get these key outcomes. People see high usage. Maybe they're only using one of those modules, right? Just as an example, maybe. Maybe there's high usage in one segment of users, but the people that you really want to use it aren't getting no usage, right? So, so really diving into that data and making sure that you're seeing these these usage indicators um, is 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 that bigger early indicator. And in, and in even if you're doing like a rollout, you know, segment to segment to segment, you still need to maintain this even if you're still in implementation, um, not just waiting again until the renewal is happening or something like that. Got it. Is there something that can be done to increase retention or basically reduce the likelihood of all of this happening um, during the sales process? In other words, uh, tell me about absolutely, that. Yeah. absolutely. So, um, no, not necessarily controversial points I'm going to bring up here, um, <laughs> but um, I believe again when you're talking about complex things and everything. A lot of people don't like the CSM's team or the CS team or the implementation team to come in during the sales cycle because the classic like, nope, you're going to slow the deal down or you're going to bring up something that's going to blow this whole thing up and everything. So you need to work together to make sure like you hear a big danger thing and you're like, oh, no, 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 like don't do that on that call. Like, oh, great. OK, we'll talk about that. Then internally, you can be like dude, like, what are you selling them? <laughs> like, besides, so, so, cause you know, I have a saying and it's part of the, you know, we're both writing books. Mine's called retention starts in implementation that, that those crucial things happen that if you have your first implementation meetings and you're finding out all this data and then you're breaking their heart three weeks into it, two weeks into it, that's a bad thing. So let's try and neutralize that in the sales process because a lot of times it's just about managing expectations, right? So, bless you. so I think um, what's well, not I think, but what's worked really well is you find some people on the post sale team that are really good in pre sales. You give them like that forty five minutes. It's usually when you're about to send the contract out and like, oh, implementation just wants to come in. They're usually loved, and I'll tell you why. You suddenly bring in somebody that can answer all of their questions ask really good questions and they're not on commission. So, so the, per, so suddenly they're like, I want to work with, is that, is that who's my CSM going to be? Like, they're great. They have that domain knowledge or use case knowledge that the people in sales don't have. And that's not because of the sales things. These people are just doing it every day. They're hearing all the different things people are doing with the product. So if you can bring them in to kind of neutralize or find out and just set expectations correctly, like, oh, you want us to integrate with Salesforce? No problems. Probably add another week or two onto the timeline. Oh, okay, that's good to know. By the way, they can help increase or or decrease the time it takes to 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 um, to get the deal signed. Sometimes because you suddenly start putting this all together, and you're like, well, this is going to take now forty five days. When does your contract with your current vendor end? And they're like thirty days. And you're like, oh, well, we got to get going right now. You know. That's happened a ton. So, so those types of conversations, expectations, like having a list of 
five or 10 questions that they can answer that you can just help set expectations better. Um, hey, you got to clean your data while we're going through contracting. All these little things can just help minimize the friction that causes all of this like trough of dis disillusionment or buyer buyer's uh, seller, seller buyer's remorse um you know two or three weeks into the project so now you said i think you alluded to bringing somebody who aren't from post sales and that's good at pre-sales i think you yeah. said at the end there uh, before signing the contract but what when specifically in other words is it is when, when would be too early, I guess, to bring them in? Because based on what you just told me, it seems like they they play a crucial role in making sure that the retention is high, which means that, and, you know, obviously to your point about they're not on commission, there's a high credibility and trust there yeah. with them as well, right? So if I'm an account executive, you know, I want, I'm going to lean on these people given what you're saying. Um, yeah. So when is the right time? Or what, what, is, what would be, I guess, too early? Yeah, too early is like when you're at like that 25, 30%. And I'm just thinking Salesforce, uh, you know, stage gates yeah. and everything like that. Um, yeah. uh, I believe when you get through the, they believe in the product, um, you know, call this what stage you want, but you know, you, you've had your salesperson come in, you've had your initial meeting, sales engineer comes in, they've probably done a demo or configured a POC type of environment, and they are now bought into this, like, yes. This is, you know, it's usually like a 50 to 75% of this at the sales. And then that number, it, it's, it's, it's earlier in the sales process, depending on the level of complexity uh, of your product. You know, if you've got it again, as I said, quick coin operated type of thing or whatever, you might not even need them. But as you start getting into more light layers of complexity, um, we've had that. Um, I, I have seen a lot of success with companies that, like don't let you send the, the the legal contract out until that meeting's happened. So um, not trying to say you should do this or not do this, but that's sort of in that time frame that you would think about. You're about to send some contracts, just need to answer a couple quick questions so we can you know, get the implementation team and the implementation part of the SOW or the MSA or whatever it is, just kind of ironed out and things like that. Um, and, and if you frame it correctly and then ask the right questions on the calls, um it, it's usually pretty smooth Got it. so let me just let's do a quick case study here for you if you will yep. future future looking i guess so let's say someone has this interview and they want to reach out to you and say jeff we've got a problem right we, we our retention is down yep. um you know we're concerned frankly that we're not going to be able to raise the next round yep where do you begin walk me through what your process is yeah absolutely um I start in pre-sales. Um, I view everything in that sort of number. Uh, it's like a, I just picture a number line, a left to right approach, right? And, and it's the customer journey. Excuse me one second before watching the video. It's the, uh, it's, it's, if you have, first of all, do you have a customer journey, right? Like, and then a lot of people don't like, okay, well, and so I will work to construct a customer journey, not, you know, I get lots of spreadsheets from sales teams, which are amazing and all the different things, but I just pull out what parts are customer facing, right? So, you know, you meet with the customer, they see the value, all the things that we just talked about. So I see, first of all, are there transition points happening in there where everybody who gets involved with the customer gets some type of level of, of transition or read in on why this customer is buying the software, right? So if they know the reasons every step of the way, A, you're reducing questions to them that lets you know that you guys are talking internally. And then you're actually setting the software up for them so they can get these key values. Um, and these, these, you know, this kind of value framework here where, um, you know, so, so you go through pre-sales, then you go through maybe a POC, then you're going through, then it's implementation. And you're making sure that if people in implementation don't know exactly why they bought the software, and we're not talking the high level bullet points for marketing, we're talking like, these are their problems. They want to fix it via that. And we know we'll achieve success when why has happened. And then I would just go through, we make sure they confirm that during the implementation, right? Hey, we heard from sales, we talked to you, this is what we have. I pull it up on a big screen on a kickoff slide. And then, and, you know, we just make sure we confirm it. Uh, so what you're seeing is every step along the way, everybody's hearing those key pain points that were brought up in the sales part, point and what the outcomes are that they're looking for. And I go through every step of the customer journey. Do you have an implementation team? Do you have CSMs? 
Um, and are they reinforcing this value along the way? So regardless of how the team's constructed or anything, there are touch points along the way to the point where they're using the software and then kind of to kick it back to what we were talking earlier, you're then having those value conversations. Look, you're seeing all this usage here. Oh, but we're not seeing it here. Let's work on this over the next 90 days. Can we get buy-in from you to get these users, blah, 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 blah. And then I, I analyze that from that pre-sales all the way through, I like to say to the point where they are on stage at a user conference talking about how much they love your software. That's the success. Not you go past the churn and retention numbers and go to the point where they are advocating for you. And that's that's where we try and get people. So I just see along the way if they're doing those these activities that get you there. You mentioned marketing, which brings up another question, because you said, you know, not the marketing high level stuff, but like, yeah. what's the real problem, right? And so yeah. I wrote it down, I'm like, well, shouldn't that be um, sort of um, synergistic as well with the whole rest of it? In other words, the marketing yeah. message should go all the way through to when they're on. It, it definitely I does. I, I think I, I view as uh, as marketing positioning points as like, um, you know, when you're writing an outline, it's it's one. Right. And then what I'm talking about is 1.a, 1.a.11, like getting into those granular points after that. That's kind of what I'm getting at. You know, getting to the, all the indented stuff in an, in an outline is kind of what I'm talking about because people are like, yes, we do want to optimize that. And thank you for your marketing team for telling me that you help optimize that. But here's what our problem is. And we're currently seeing issues here and we're hoping your software helps us get there and, you know, and getting into all those specific use cases and everything. I wrote down, uh, I should say my producer noted that the, the, uh, we left off the last conversation. We had a pre interview and you talked about how cr crucial it was for the CRO and customer success, success leader to be connected, yep. um, and communicating. Um, and in quotes, why report to a distracted CRO and the CEO, why does yeah, why yeah. report to a distracted CEO when the CRO knows all the numbers and projections? Tell me about your thoughts there. Yeah, and then I'm just writing a note here to make sure I cover this other thing. Um, so, and, and for people that usually listen to your podcast, they might not even know about this movement in the CS world, but they've probably heard it, which is that CCOs, which is chief customer officer, which owns every customer facing thing post sale, which is support, success, implementation, professional services, perhaps learning and, and all those other fun things, but uh, customer marketing as well. There's a big movement saying that they, they need a seat at the table the boardroom and the re the way to get that is to report to the CEO. And I'm like, yes. And in theory, I get it. However, you know, when you're in a startup world, that CEO most of the time does not have the revenue hat usually, right? They're usually more of an evangelist. They're usually in 8 million different directions as well too. Um, you know, their main job is getting funding for the company. And so, uh, and then executing on that strategy and then hiring the right people underneath them to go execute on it. So those people usually aren't the best with having a money conversation, having a relationship conversation. So if they're not of that mindset or have that skill set in their background, does it make sense for the CCO to report into that person? Um, a lot of the time in the conversations that I'm talking about, um, you know, the CSM teams will get that training from the salespeople. And, the, and this is, these are, these are how we talk about the software. This is how we sell it. And then this is how we want you to work on it. So that's, that's where I'm talking about is, is, you know, ha reporting into a distracted person who's maybe not even looking at the numbers. I've seen that they're just not, they don't know what to look for. It goes back to our first conversation on just focused on growth they're not looking at these CSM numbers or the, you know, the retention numbers and everything. They're not even you know, worried about it until their board tells them that they are, but a sales leader usually will, will, will have that. And, and the, the good ones do, they know that this is total overall revenue. They may want to own that number, which is fine. Um, you just want to make sure that the, the, when people say seat at the table, kind of gets into well what are the key outcomes you're expecting from that oh it's being able to talk in this manner make sure that you can get those same key outcomes if you report to a cro all right that's a great explanation 
how do you separate the product from the process? In other words, what if the product is just not up to par? <laughs> uh, what are you talking? I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, that's why some of that pre-work is so critical. And in, 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 like, I, I, I sometimes, what I usually say is I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, bust the the salesperson's dreams right and so and so like sometimes so like maybe not even be part of that conversation sometimes because you know the that team that is going in and walking through the difficult questions and everything they sometimes they, they know they know where everything's buried right and you want your sales team to be out there selling on those marketing value points sometimes how you get there is a little ugly right and so um and, and so we try and actually keep that stuff a little away from the sales team and just keep it where you've got a tight coordination between that implementation team and the product team. Um, and so uh, what we normally do in that scenario is when customers are asking for certain things, ask them why, right? Like the, I always used to call this the, like the big red button because we had a customer that we were upgrading from using Excel into like a like a Tableau sort of situation. And they were like, we need this red button. Like, you know, we, you know, we just always called it the red button. And we're like, well, what's the red button do? And they're like, oh, it's an export to Excel. And we're like, oh, or export to CSV, excuse me. And why? Because they can then go dump it into their data tool or whatever. And we're like, oh, so you just need an export tool? And they're like, yeah. And so, but everybody gets focused on the like, where is it located? What does it look like? I'm used to seeing X. So you got to cut down, especially when product might be catching up to the marketing is, well, what are you, again, it goes back to the key value. What are you trying to get out of the software? We're like, what is that feature? What are you trying to get out of it? And everything you go back, talk to product, Customers looking to find out how you do X, Y, and Z, and they might tell you, "Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, just go do X, you know, go talk to this or go talk to." Let's get Dev involved. Maybe they got to do a little backdoor thing, or maybe they elevate something in the roadmap. Which again, if you found this out, seventy-five percent of the deal, you might get an extra month or two for the product team to get that thing that you discovered to get shipped. Versus the like worst case scenario, which I've bumped into a lot, which is Hey, um, that feature is not ready yet. To, oh, that's critical for us. Oh, well, then you're going to have to wait another three to four weeks. That means we're going to pay for our other vendor that we were trying to shut down. We're going to have to go. So now we're paying for two systems. And that's that, my friend, is uncomfortable <laughs> conversation. What do you wind up doing? Well, you're going to tack an extra another month onto the end of the deal for no revenue, all these other little things. And so you, you try and trying to avoid those situations so yeah do your discovery up front and uh maybe you can you can avoid that where you can the idea here is that um you try and that scenario i just talked about maybe that happens five or ten percent of the time but not 50 percent of the time right because it's always going to happen always so you just want to get get it down to a manageable sort of thing so speaking of avoiding situations and doing your discovery up front are there Companies, and again, specifically, obviously, we're talking B2B SaaS, but are there specific B2B SaaS companies that, or even instances, I guess I should say, that you aren't able to help, or frankly, you just don't feel is a good customer for you? You know, for, for me specifically, or? Yeah, um, for, for I, infinite renewals, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 so um, if, if a company is true PLG, you know, drop your credit card in and walk away. There's really, you know, I'm really not a good fit for that. Um, well, we can still make sure that they have a higher touch approach. So, uh, but usually product and marketing sort of work on that. There's some really large companies like that. They don't have a CS team. They might have some ops that trigger off emails and things like that. So that that those are usually the types of companies. I also don't work with non B two B companies usually, so no commerce sites or things like that. Um, you know, and I'm trying to think of anything else. Yeah, so if you're in SaaS B two B, it's usually a pretty good fit. So unless you're PLG, right. yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, I get, and I guess another way of asking is, are there products? that 
you look at or maybe you, you're looking under the hood, I guess, and you're saying, well, this product doesn't really do what marketing says it can do. And yeah. so I don't want to set myself up for, you know, failure. No, I, I um, that's a great question. I usually that is one of the issues, right? Actually, literally just got off a call where I discovered some of this. <laughs> and, and it's sort of what, I, what my message usually is there is that you can fix all these downstream problems, right? You can get your team doing the value work and you can get the, you know, all of this stuff that we kind of went over. However, you need to fix this area as well too. It's been identified, and by the way, but I don't put my recommendations forward just based on one person, right? You gotta go through and build the case up and you know, it's a, do it in kind of like a McKinsey way of like building up and presenting the, the, the problems and things. Um, so, so you basically say, you know, we could do all this work over here, but you still need to put these initiatives into, you know, classic problems, by the way, are um, no ad, no admin work, no administration types of panels for users to go use. So everything becomes configured. Oh, I don't want to have to keep reaching out to people. There's a, uh, you know, personalization stuff that's missing. Integrations are missing. Things like those are like the classic things that keep coming up or things that just take too long where, you know, you have got some companies, they approach a problem via configuration and some people approach a, a, a technical problem via like like an agent that goes out and just automatically does stuff. And that, that second thing takes a really long time to build, but you'll have a happier customer and a, a much faster time to live slash time to value if you do that extra work in your product to make the product smoother for your, for your, um, for your customers to use. Yeah, that makes sense. Tell me about infinite renewals and your vision for infinite renewals. After all, this is the goats of growth. Um, yeah. to talk about you know what what how professional services and, and doing it right can help companies raise money, raise more money just based on their ability to retain customers and, and grow from there, of course. Yep. But we look at infinite renewals and you've been a part of at least, I believe, one IPO or and or. Yeah, let's see, one, one IPO and then and then uh, two purchases that were way above the value of that IPO. So, <laughs> uh, so a couple billion dollar transactions um, as well. So um, yeah, so I got a lot of this based on, you know, when I was in professional services and helping run the professional services team so I was always paired with the heavy hitters, right? From the get-go, even when I was a pre-sales um, developer, I was always <laughs> paired with the enterprise sales reps that need, and, they, and there was some customization and some PS that work that was needed. Um, and then this world of customer success and all of that started coming along the way when SaaS came around, right? However, what I saw in my vision of this is to remove all of this sort of, Ah, boy, my well, hopefully my CS friends won't be listening to this, but like there's this like mythology that they've built around it. And I'm like, guys, come on. Can I swear on this? I'm like, it's, it's just fucking account management, but it's a better version of it. Right. And I'm like, stop making it be like this thing. We got to hug our customers and pleasure and delight them and all this stuff. I'm like, just so I my vision of this is to be, you know, it's why, you know, get shit done, go in, do the stuff that you need to do. And kind of remove for my company, I, I love that people love working with us because we roll up our sleeves. My most common objection handling is, are you going to do the work or are you just going to give us a recommendation? And I'm like, I, I just got to get through the recommendations and <laughs> do the work um, or help you do the work. Um, so, so my goal is to just work with companies that like working with a company that just wants to get stuff done and you know we, we do have our elements of strategy and why you need to do things as well but we're not in that bain mckinsey world of doing things where you've got to go through a three-month process to even get what the next steps need to be i'm a little bit like what's the current problems boom let's go fix that here you know two weeks in two weeks in do your research prove hypothesis go 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 so my goal is just to keep you know growing growing to where we can still give you that you know personal touch 
We're not bringing in a bunch of five-year interns and things like that. Everybody on my team, you could drop in as a CCO at any company and they do amazing. So, um, so it's, it's growing that team so we can satisfy the demand of companies that want to go do this work. And yeah, that's, I'll stop there. Yeah. Is your, do, you, do you have any vision of getting to, let's say, I'm just throwing a huge number out there, say like a 100 people on your team doing that type of work for, you know, you know, when, when I see that, you know, I say like, you know, there's a core number of us, but then I look at all the other functions that I use like contractors for like the marketing and the social media and then this and that. So, yeah. so boom, there's like 10 people right there, right? Um, yeah. hundred people. I've been parts of some consulting companies where everything kind of like fell off the rails after like 50 people, right? I, I, I am lucky in the fact that I, there are a bunch of people with my profile that want to stop working at their um, SaaS company and start doing what I'm doing. Um, so I'm working, you know, I've got this sort of two year plan where we're not doing as much fractional work. If we do fractional work, it's only for a shorter time frame. So we can just go in and get what needs to be done, get their people hired and go. Um, and then from there, I will very selectively bring in people that can, you know, do the work um, and uh, and go from there. So maybe 20 of us tops and then maybe some support staff and, you know, you know, report creators and marketing people and stuff like that, but not not too large. Um, I've been through this, so, but, you know, I think there was a point it was like triple hockey stick growth, like from 2000 through 2015 and total burnout from there. And I'm really just trying to, you know, do it in a way that's that's scalable for me. So. Yeah, makes yeah. I hear you. I hear you for sure. Awesome. Well, you we ready to get into the rapid fire five? Asking I'm ready to go. Questions. I might have answered one or two of them already, but <laughs> <laughs> well, we're almost bleeding into the second one, which I'll ask you in a second. But yeah, let me start with the first one, which is what motivates you. What motivates? Well, first of all, I've got three daughters that I need to get through college, so that motivates me, and I want to. I want to enjoy my 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 retirement and not have it start at seventy five. But I still, I don't know, I still like to be involved in it. So, what motivates me actually is that first factor of seeing like logging into LinkedIn every day and seeing what I just talked about and just voluminous texts on massively long blog posts and things like that and just it motivates me to just really streamline that make it really easy to talk about and saying like nah here's the problem you're not renewing enough you're not focusing on your customers let's go in there and fix it and fix the problem right it's that that's what I'm, that's what motivates me um so I, you know i'm kind of also like bill belichick boardroom type of stuff like i look for that thing that might not be too inflammatory and then i'm like i can't believe they said you're right like you're all fired up and everything right? you know fake billboard materials <laughs> yeah, of course, right uh yes i think michael jordan was pretty famous for that too oh yeah, absolutely yeah name a big goal you have right now and when would you like to accomplish it yeah that big goal um it, it's for me it's really reducing the fractional work um and and anybody that does fractional work and then combine it with project work knows what i mean because oh i wish i remember the name of the book but it's essentially like you know money is killing your business or something which is sort of in this thing that you can't go work and expand and do the things that you need to do because you're so busy working on the stuff right and so mm -hmm. when i'm I give it my all when I'm a fractional leader, and then that doesn't give me the time to go do all the other things that need to go get done. So the idea is to um, just reduce the fractional work and do a lot more project based work, which means, you know, back to sales stuff, more, more conversations, you know, bigger funnel, more pipeline, and being able to work on those things so that, um, you know, we can have you know, instead of one, you know, six to 10 month fractional gig, you know, maybe three projects or something like that. And there's more, I'm just speaking me, there's, you know, a bunch of us on the team, they actually only do project work. So, yeah. Got it. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. What's your preferred, most preferred way to learn new information to stay sharp? Audio and video. I am, uh, I, I, you know, every morning walking my dog, um, and uh, I've got some type of podcast going or audio book um, going, you know, uh, you've suggested it is obviously yours. There's some good ones out there, too. Um, and then I'll, I'll try and kind of bounce it between podcasts and audio. 
when I'm learning a more complicated concept, uh, even when it comes down to like guitar and other things, like I'm a video sort of, I'm a, you know, I was a bright co for many years too. That's a video <laughs> on my platform. So very big video and uh, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm prefer to send out loom videos instead of typing them, typing up long emails. So yeah, so yeah, video. How many hours of sleep do you average per night? Oh, my Fitbit's telling me 7.5 right now. I'm a huge believer of sleep, you know, and uh, you still do the whole Jocko 4.30 in the morning thing that that's not happening anymore based on my kids getting older and needing now their sports practices will go to like 9.30 and things like that. So so I've had to reconstruct the day a little bit better. But, um, you know, I'm, you know, I, I like to be lights down by 9.30, 10 and then, you know, get a good night's sleep and get up and get after it. So. Yeah. What's your favorite thing to do when you aren't working? Well, obviously, it's just being with the family. And so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, I love that. However, they get sick of me too. Um, I don't know if you see, I've got a couple of guitar amps over here, and you don't see I all did. the stuff that's over here. So, yeah, yeah. I love playing guitar. I, um, and um, I go to a local blues jam down at, uh, if you ever go to um, the porch in Medford amazing southern food down there um you know and, i think i have been there uh, yeah. several years ago and every I'm sunday glad you reminded me. Yeah. every sunday there's a blues jam and although i'm not the, like mr blues guy um a little too busy to be in a band i had to leave my band um uh, uh, last year um and so that's my opportunity to go play with some really good musicians and, and stuff like that i also just want to say I, I still love coaching um my daughter's sports so i'm coaching we talked about this i'm still coaching uh fifth grade girls hoops um, my soccer is done but uh i play lacrosse in college and i also coach fifth grade girls uh, lacrosse uh, for my town as well too yeah you and i are both passionate about those things yeah for sure and for those of you listening we uh, Jeff and I happen to live in Massachusetts together. So that's why you mentioned that uh, the porch there. Yeah. And okay. Let me ask you a question that came from one of my other guests. And then I'm going to ask you a question that you would like to ask a future guest. Sure. So the question is very simple. What location would you like to travel to? Oh, that's an awesome question. So, um, I just it's it's painful because we were going to go there this year and we just couldn't make it happen is um, I am half Italian and uh, and I have not been to Italy and uh, and and so I've been dying to go there and <laughs> coincidentally everybody else in my direct family has gone and so um, we really want to go I haven't gone there and um, so that's that's where I'm dying to go to is, is to Italy I also want to see like the Egypt, the pyramids in Egypt to some, or the, you see this, the big desert. I'm just dying to go to one of those types of places. I don't know if they're the safest to go now, but like um, someday I'd, I'd love to be able to, to, to hit up the pyramids as well, too. I have been to Italy 20, oh, 20 years ago. Jealous. It's for a girl, though, so I didn't see much of this. <laughs> I mean, our family is from this, like, li like the classic little seacoast town, you know, like and, and just dying to go there and, and just um, and just check it all out. That would be great. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. What question would you like for me to ask my next guest? Ah, you should, I wish I had, you know, boy, that's a I wish I had thought about this a little bit. Um, you, you catch me a little off guard and I'm usually very pragmatic in my questions about like, what's your biggest problem these days? Like so mine is always yeah, sort of so academic. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And I'm, my big curiosity is, is like, what's, what's a, a non-business book that really helps you out with business. Right. Like, uh, like the influence and persuasion by Baldini, I believe it's something like that, where you just learn a lot of really cool stuff. And if, but it's not like, I'm not a big fan of the, the Gladwell books where it's like, it could be 10 pages and here's your concept, but now we're going to hammer it home for 15 chapters. Like, it's just not my, my bag. So I tend not to listen to a lot of the business books because it's just that hammering of the concepts in over and over again. You know, what's interesting, as soon as you asked that question, what's a non-business book that really helps you out with business, the first thing that came to mind was influenced by Robert Cialdini, because <laughs> yeah. I think it's fantastic. You know, it's really a book, it's like a psychology book, but it's about marketing, but it's, and frankly, it's helped me even raise my kids, to be honest with you. I think it's just a great book, um, just in terms of, so, you know. There's a concept in that book that I probably use like five times a week, and it's to get, I use it 
when I'm trying to convince people to charge for their implementation or professional services fees, which is that story he had about the, like it was like a Grand Canyon gift shop and there's these earrings that weren't moving because they were selling for yeah. like nine ninety nine, and the, yeah. the girl accidentally made them like a hundred dollars and then they sold out that night. Like, it's just that like, if it's cheap, people view it as cheap and they're not gonna wanna pay the money for it and, yep. uh, and, and go from there. So I love that story, yeah. My favorite one is because when it comes to raising your kids, because again, there's that word, because when I'm asking them to do something, if I follow it with because, it has much better chance of of, uh, of getting done. So Absolutely. That's, yeah. yeah. That's just my little, my yeah. little one there. <laughs> How can folks reach out to you to say thank you for um, educating them on on what you do uh, yep. and also to just to say thank you and all that wonderful stuff. Oh, I appreciate that. Um, you know, find me on LinkedIn, uh, although my name's really hard to spell sometimes, but it was, I can guarantee you it was much worse before Ellis Island. Um, but uh, <laughs> infinite renewals.com uh, is, or you can search on infinite renewals, but um, you know, I'm usually, I'm usually around on LinkedIn and um, answering questions and things like that. So connect to me, don't try and sell me anything, but uh, I'm just kidding, but uh, um, <laughs> happy to, uh, to connect with people there. I post a lot of blogs, um, do a podcast and, and do have my sort of video channel. That's very much like um, five minute quick, quick hits. People send me questions in and if they start coming in, I, I uh, so this is a newer thing for me this year being the big video person that I am, is that um, although I was doing podcasts for a while, a lot of times I want to pull up a diagram or something like that. So I just started recording them and then found somebody on Fiverr to go edit them and um, started uploading them to YouTube. So youtube.com channel's name is Infinite Renewals. And uh, that's where we, you, you can look for a playlist called like 10 minute tips. And that's where we really try and uh, you know, do that and have some great shorts in there too that seem to be doing really well. People really like the shorts these days. So, uh, so you know, find a, find a good, you know, 20 year old content marketer and they can do some amazing things. So this is, this is a message to my, uh, my aforementioned producer, Charan. Um, let's get these, these videos, these short videos that we're sharing on LinkedIn onto TikTok and YouTube. Oh, yeah. no, number two search engine in the world is YouTube. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. We have to, we're, we're underutilizing that just because I spent so much time on LinkedIn, but that's, something that needs to, to get done. Um, yep. So that's what we'll do. And also uh, your podcast is called Getting Services Done. People can find that on Apple and Spotify. Yep, yep, that's awesome. it. It's, uh, you know, it was originally just the GSD podcast and the S will stand for either services, software, <laughs> or success. <laughs> Um, but you know, I'm a, I'm a GSD kind of a guy and, uh, I'm going to stick with that name no matter what anybody tells me to do. <laughs> so I thought you were going to say shit, getting shit done. Well, that's what it, yeah, that's, that's what it, <laughs> that's, that's where it comes from. So it's a little play on that. So yeah. 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 <laughs> I love it. Love it. Jeff Kush Merrick, by the way, that's K-U-S-H-M-E-R-E-K. You can find him if you're looking for him on LinkedIn. Thank you for doing the Goats of Growth. Thanks for having me. I appreciate letting uh, a non-sales leader come over and uh, talk about how we can all be friends. And so I appreciate it. <laughs> oh, that's exactly why I had you on, because it's different. Thank you, everybody. Hear the music. <laughs>